And welcome back to the Moving Pictures Podcast. Happy episode two. We made it through the premiere and um, we're back for another movie. Um, today we are going to discuss I, Tanya. First and foremost, as always, this is your spoiler alert warning. But since this is a biopic, so it's a movie about a person, it's a film biography, if you will. It's about Tanya Harding, the figure skater. I feel like I'm not going to really spoil anything because it's it's based on the true story of her life. So I feel like I'll only really give you new information that you didn't know about the real life person or um, just kind of like behind the scenes of the movie. I don't, I mean, there's nothing really to spoil. We all know what happened. Um, and if you don't know, you can Google it. So still, I guess, spoiler alert, if you want to see the movie and don't want to hear me talk about it first, go watch it and come back. And second of all, um, my upstairs neighbors have decided to be extremely loud today, more than usual. So um, if you hear stomping or creaking or, you know, something that sounds like Bigfoot, that's what that is at all hours of the day. It's great. And thirdly, I have ordered Papa John's. So if my phone goes off because the gate is calling, I will have to answer that. But, you know, I'm... I might be able to edit it out. If I'm like mid-sentence, I'll just leave it. But just so you guys know, um, I'm super, super excited for this episode. So let's get into it. Um, wow. Was this movie emotional or what? I mean, I cried more than once. I felt like crying almost the entire movie because, I mean, her life has been so hard and I feel like so so much of this film is about like perseverance and circumstances, you know, mainly bad ones. And just like the pure athleticism of this woman is also just so moving to me. And I think, I mean, I think everyone's like at that athletic mindset of like, go, 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 never quit is just so amazing to me. I don't particularly think of myself as an athlete. I consider myself a dancer. I consider myself like a recreational sports user. I don't think I have like the athlete's mentality of like pure motivation and discipline and um, that kind of, I don't know. I think if you're an athlete, you get it. If you're not an athlete, you just, you, you just don't have it. Anyway, so I'm just going to like cover the details and then I'll go into like synopsis and just kind of background and just kind of, you know, sum up kind of what you can Google, just kind of like what the story is of Tanya Harding. So, you know, just the gist, it was released in January of 2017. The director is Craig Gillisby. It's written by Stephen Rogers. It's produced by Tom Ackerley, Marco Robbie, Stephen Rogers, and Brian Unkelis. Also, the director of photography is Nicholas, um, we're going to call him Kay. I looked up how to say his last name and I still can't pronounce it. Um, it I'll spell it out for you guys. K-A-R-A-K-A-T-S-A-N-I-S. And it was edited by Tatiana S. Regal. The music is by Peter Nashel. It's distributed by Neon and 30 West, um, as well as Paramount Pictures. And it is starring Margot Robbie, who plays Tanya Harding. Sebastian Stan, who plays Tanya's ex-husband, Jeff Galuli. Allison Janey, who plays Lavana Golden, who is Tanya Harding's mom. Julianne Nicholson, who plays Diane Rawlingson, which is Harding's skating coach. Caitlin Carver, who is playing Nancy Kerrigan. Paul Walter Hauser, who is playing Sean Eckhart. And Ricky Roussert, who is playing Shane Stant. The budget was $11 million, and in the box office, they made $53.9 million. Um... I saw it in theaters for the first time and then obviously have seen it since and I have seen it recently, but it was amazing in theaters. I really, really, really loved seeing it on the big screen. I feel like it's just so, so much more beautiful when you can see it um, on screen. Oh, here's my pizza. Hello, this is Katie. Hi, uh Oh yeah, if you just go to the call box and just hit 
think I can let you in. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. So the synopsis is a 2017 biographical sports comedy film following the life of figure skater Tanya Harding and her connection to the 1994 attack on her rival and Olympic teammate Nancy Kerrigan. Um, again, this is a biopic. This is a film about Tanya Harding. It is based on true events. This film really has based itself off of there not being one truth because they're interviewing multiple people to get all the information. They are basing this um, off of Tanya Harding's perspective, but they're also kind of putting in other people's um, recounts of what happened. And so technically, who, depending on who you ask, they would say some things are true, some things aren't. Um, and that's kind of the point. I guess that was the goal. The director has talked a lot about how they wanted to really focus on Tanya Harding's truth because they're telling her story but how they also wanted it to look like, depending on who you asked, certain things would be true and certain things would be false. It's it's about everybody having their own truth. And I think that's really cool. And I also think that that helps kind of bring in like a world, I guess. It creates this, this big world um, that really emulates real life and reality. And I think that that is just kind of life. And I think that's really cool. So background, if you don't know, Tanya Harding is an Olympic figure skater. Um, she's a retired boxer and is now a reality TV personality, which I didn't know. Um, so super cool to kind of look into that. Um, she was born Tanya Maxine Harding on November 12th, 1970 in Portland, Oregon. She was raised primarily by her abusive mother, Lavanya. I got my pizza. Okay. Pause. Intermission. Okay. And we are back. Um, that pizza was amazing. And I, I think it brought me back to life for today. So anyway, back to the background. Um, so Tanya Harding was born in Portland, Oregon in 1970. Um, she, what are all these noises in my apartment right now? I think that was the ice. So she was raised primarily by her abusive mother, um, and she began taking figure skating lessons starting at three years old, and it is said that her mom, like, forced her into it. She dropped out of high school to devote to the sport, and um, she climbed the ranks in the U.S. figure skating competitions between 1986 and 1989, and she started winning competitions and getting noticed during this time. She won the 1989 Skate America competition, which I think is like her first like big win. She was also a 1991 and 1994 US champion before being stripped of her 1994 title. And then she was a 1991 world silver medalist. She also became the first American woman and the second woman in history to successfully land a triple axel in competition. So this is huge. And this is in the film. She's wearing the blue like leotard. That was number one, an amazing accomplishment for her. And number two, an amazing scene in the film. I think they shot it so beautifully. And I think just having like the narration over it of her talking about what it felt like. And then in addition to the commentators being like, is she going to land it? Is she going to even try it? And it's really interesting to kind of just get that insight so you can really understand why it's such a big deal. You guys, I got so emotional during the scene. I was like, this is monumental for her and it was just so it was just so well done. I felt like I was there. I felt like I was inside her brain, like inside of her, of her emotions and I really I think this whole movie I felt like I was just being pulled by my heartstrings attached to to Margot Robbie as Tanya Harding because the whole movie was just such like a whirlwind, but I, all of my emotions were connected to her. So if Margot Robbie starts crying, I started tearing up slash crying. I mean, if she was, like, super emotional, I was super emotional. If she got mad, I got mad. I think that indicates that it's such a good movie. Just kind of from every, every angle. I think from, like, the production side. You know, the filming, the directing, the lights, the camera. All of that kind of side of it, I think, can either make or break a film. But that combined with Margot Robbie's acting, I think just really 
just just set it apart from I think a lot of other biopic films that I've seen and this just felt so personal so personal and I felt I it's like I almost kind of felt like honored to like go on this journey with her because it was I felt that intertwined so synopsis the biggest controversial scandal um, and kind of the thing that Tanya Harding, I think, is mostly known for is in January of 1994, she got entangled in this scandal when her ex-husband orchestrated an attack on her fellow U.S. skating rival, Nancy Kerrigan. So I think it's like a controversial debate whether she knew about it or not. She states that she didn't know. And based on the movie, they kind of um, insinuate that she really didn't know that it was going to happen and that it was more so her bodyguard and her ex-husband who really just like decided to do it on their own just to like help Tanya, I guess. And I did see, I looked up like the actual footage of this happening in real life to Nancy Kerrigan. And I mean, this poor girl is like writhing in pain. This guy that Jeff had hired just like whacked her right above the knee and he bruised the bone but it didn't break you know Tanya was punished for this so um on March 16th 1994 this is when she pled guilty to the conspiracy to hinder prosecution so she gets you know kind of like all these different punishments where she has to like donate money to these like skating charities and the DA's office and she has to do like 500 community service hours etc probation but then the last thing that the judge says is, you know, you're banned for life from competing, for figure skating. And this just, like, sends her... She doesn't freak out, which I feel like beginning of the movie Tanya would have freaked out. But but she's just, like, sobbing. And she's like, I have nothing. I would rather go to jail. Give me the 18 months that you gave the other people. I would rather die than not skate. And the judge just um, was like, you know, I, I made that ruling. So... That's really heartbreaking and also one of my favorite scenes. But but basically because of that, she competed as a professional boxer from 2003 to 2004. And now she's more of a TV personality. And I know that she's like consulted on this film and the documentaries that are about her and about the scandal with Nancy Kerrigan. So I think she's just kind of more so telling her story now than anything else. But she cannot skate. I mean... Whew, that has got to be horrible. I mean, oh, anyway, th that scene, I you guys should go look at it because that scene is so moving. Like Margot Robbie's, like the progression of her tears is just so realistic. And I, I feel like for me as a crier, I don't like to cry in front, specifically in front of people. But honestly, I, I don't like to cry over like spilled milk. I want to cry over the accumulation of all of these things that has just kind of pushed me over the edge and just like let it all come out that's when I cry but something like this if that had happened to me I think my tears would be the exact same where like it, they start to come and then the more that she tries to talk the worse the tears are and the more choked up she sounds and the more like the the shallower breaths that, that she takes those are quicker and more shallow and she like can't get that deep breath and to me that is the kind of crying that would come realistically with this kind of news in this kind of setting and it was just beautiful I mean I get chills just thinking about it all of her emotional states that go you know quiet to boom just sobbing or yelling in in an instant or it, it just you see all of the emotion on Margot Robbie's face and you can feel it. And I think it's really, really realistic, but it's also accurate to who Tanya is and who it, kind of how she describes her personality, how other people describe her personality. She's hot tempered, you know, she's been called trashy. And that's, that's kind of like, that was her image for a very long time. And I think that, you know, it's really shown in the movie, but it also was shown in the way of how she's fighting to win competitions and so many of the judges were like you're just not the ideal American athlete you don't have this perfect family background and you don't have the look and you don't have the money and it she really had to persevere and fight through all of those barriers 
And I think Margot Robbie's acting just kind of lets you feel that very, very well. Let's get into a bit of the accuracy and kind of see what, see kind of what's true to the story and what's not. Bear in mind, like I said before, so many different people were in on this, was this true, was this not true kind of questioning. And so we can't really get a straight answer because it's just kind of the, the quote unquote facts are more experiences that each person has. So to me, you can't really get the facts on a conversation or on, you know, how certain events occurred. But I think it's also valid for each person, if that makes sense. So History versus Hollywood considers this movie drawn from multiple versions of the same events rather than a movie specifically based on true events. So that's kind of what I was saying. Like it's multiple versions of one thing. Um, and so like I said, this movie is really focused on Tanya Harding's perspective because it's her biopic. But her ex-husband Jeff Galuli's perspective is like very heavily included as well. It's funny too because, you know, they do like the mockumentary, documentary style um, interviews with Tanya and Jeff and they kind of like piece it in throughout the film. And I think, first of all, that was a really cool addition just to kind of make it feel like more real and feel make it feel more like it was kind of a documentary which also goes along with the narration that Margot Robbie does kind of throughout the film is Tanya Harding and it's funny though because they're separate interviews when the when the director and the writer interviewed the real life Jeff and Tanya none of their stories matched up their first date story didn't match up any of their fights didn't match up their, I mean, marriage and their wedding and, and these these monumental events, none of them matched up. They said that things happened completely differently. Um, they kind of had, it was, it was as if they were kind of in two different places and not at the same event or in the same conversation. And that just kind of goes to show how different perspectives can be in the same room and with the same event and with the same conversation how different experiences can be. The writer and the director really put this into the film to show you the disconnect there that can happen when there's, you know, I guess hearsay or or just kind of different recountings of life events. So the Nancy Kerrigan feud is accurate. It did happen, all of that. They made sure to kind of get the facts of the controversy and of the accident very correct. And what's funny is that you know, I kind of did a deep dive into the history of Nancy and Tanya and the public seemed to like Nancy more. And I think that's because they wanted this, you know, American image that I talked about before. But Tanya was known as a slightly better skater, which I thought was interesting because the movie really hits on the, the people in the figure skating world, specifically judges, would always criticize her for things that weren't related to skating. And so Tanya would come in and say, why did I get the score? You know, I'm basically, I'm such a good skater, why are you giving me lower scores? And they basically were like, well, it's not all about the skating. And I think that was like, just kind of a big, big, big part of Tanya Harding's struggle. And I think that's also why it makes her more of like, an American athlete. I feel like these themes are still accurate today, you know? Anyway, so Tanya's mother's abuse, yes. Um, she was abused as a child. She said that her mother would hit her and beat her in public starting around six or seven years old. There was usually one day a week where she wouldn't get beaten, if that. And her mother says that they didn't have any problems until Tanya got up in her, into her teens. And she also says that, that she never abused any of her children. She spanked, but didn't abuse. And most of her children disagree. Tanya says that the steak knife incident where her mom like threw a steak knife into her arm was true. That did happen. But of course her mother denies it and on all else, basically she denies. Um, and so Tanya and her mom haven't spoken since 2002. And this I saw in almost every article I read. People asked, did Tanya really tell a judge, suck my d No, that didn't actually happen in real life. But the real Tanya Harding told Margot Robbie and, and the production crew that she wished she had said that in real life because it was iconic and she loved that scene so much. I really love it. I think it just kind of modernizes, you know, Tanya Harding's temper. And I mean, I think today, you know, maybe she would have said some other stuff, but you know, regardless, I think it was great. 
was Tanya Harding the first American woman to perform a triple axel in a competition? Yes. February 16th, 1991 was her first successful execution of a triple axel at the U.S. National Figure Skating Championship in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which, you know, I already spoke about. This is when she's wearing the blue teal costume, which basically looks exactly like what the real Tanya Harding wore, in my opinion. Um, so the costume design was amazing. And then in March of 1991, at the World Figure Skating Championships in Munich, she became the first American woman to complete a triple axel at an international event. So she made a lot of benchmarks, I think, in history and just for, for figure skating. What I loved, this is just kind of my perspective. I feel like so much of this film just, I feel like this film was just so beautifully created that that I just, I like melted with it. I was like, this story is just carrying me. I don't have to do the work. And not not to say that it doesn't make you think, and then it's not like an intellectual film, because it is. I think it really does make you put yourself in her shoes, but I think in such an easy way, it made me feel like I could just ebb and flow with the film and know what was happening and be able to like feel the emotion and think about what what was happening and just kind of piece it all together. And to me, I, I, I really like that. I like a, a film that isn't just brain candy, you know, that doesn't just numb you kind of um, because it's just so easy to watch and not at all educational or intellectual or like brain food substantial wise. I, I think there's also a place for that. But all that to say in this biopic, I feel like that was really important that it wasn't just brain candy and that you couldn't just sit and, you know, do something else and still be able to focus on the film. I think you really had to sit and pay attention and focus and feel it and just kind of um, just put yourself there. But because of the production and the acting and the lights and the camera and the filming, it just really made it easy to do that. It wasn't a chore. I really loved that. But what I loved is when they would break the fourth wall, aka when they would talk to the camera. So when characters come out of the film and they like talk to the audience, to me that just makes it feel so much more personal. You could say that, you know, that brings you out of the film and reminds you that you're watching a movie instead of like being in the story. But I think it was just more engaging. It made it really cool and it made me just kind of be more engaged and more um, kind of, it felt more intentional, if that makes sense, to like pull you in. And that's what I mean by it was just so easy to be in the story and I think that contributes to it. I really liked the shallow depth of field, which if you're a photographer or in the film industry, you know, you'll know what that means. But for those of you who don't, shallow depth of field and just depth in field in general is telling the camera, the lens, what to focus on shallow depth of field means that what's closest to the camera, the lens, is in focus. And it's basically the only thing in focus, depending on how how high or low your f-stop is. And what I like about that is that it gives your eye specific direction on what to look at and what to pay attention to. And for these crowd scenes where, you know, she's ice skating and there's just waves, like an ocean of people, what I love that the shallow depth of field does is it makes the crowd kind of form into one and you can just kind of see the specs. And to me, that just emphasizes how many people are there watching her skate. And I think that's the whole point. Like when she's competing in the Olympics, you don't want to see each individual crowd member. You just want to let the audience know that there are 20 rows of people and there's not one empty seat around the entire stadium. Does that make sense? So to me, I thought that was really special that you can hear the crowd roaring and like you see these these lights flashing that are supposed to emulate um, photographers. But I just love that like we're, we're not distracted by the audience. We just get to see the glitz and the glam of her like finishing her routine or landing that triple axle or going to talk to the judge. Like it's just so I think important in crowd scenes to really make sure you're leading the audience and like kind of manipulating their eye to where you want them to look and what you want them to pay attention to, which I think this film does it really well. I also just like how they use the telephoto lens with this 35 millimeter kind of ratio. Like if you think, to put it into perspective, our eyes see it 50 millimeters naturally. That's your realm of, of perspective and sight. And so 35 is basically the wide lens on your phone. It's just not distorted. So 
just kind of think about if like your eyes could go further back towards your head, I guess. That's how that's how I <laughs> kind of understood it and, and kind of learned how to view it. But what I like about that is that we get to see more around what's happening. So you get more of this world, you get a better picture, you just have more detail. And combined with a telephoto lens, which just widens things, you really get to see, first of all, the symmetry. Because having like Tanya just like stand perfectly in the middle and having the um, the exact same amount on either side of her was just so visually appealing to me. I love, love, love symmetry. But I think also you just get to see more. So, okay, for example, when um, she's in the red leotard, she finishes her routine and she's holding both hands out to either side of her body and the crowd's cheering and, you know, she's like done with her routine. That's her ending pose. I mean, you can see almost from the tip of her left finger all the way to the tip of her right fingers. And to me, that just gives like this beautiful view of symmetry, but also just her. You get to see like her entirety. And I feel like that helps with the emotional side, but it also helps really depict this this image and this scene and this event and this story. I don't know how well I explained that, but it made sense to me. Um, <laughs> the crying makeup scene changed my life. If you've seen Euphoria, you probably have seen people put this scene of Itania putting on her makeup and crying, trying not to cry, alongside Cassie from Euphoria, crying in the bathroom and trying to smile through it. I think there's just something so beautiful about trying to change your emotional state. I think we do it all the time. I think we try to push aside our emotions, specifically if they're bad, all the time. And I think seeing this kind of come to life in such like a tear jerking way and just seeing it so like heartfelt, to me felt so raw and real and realistic and kind of what I want in a film. It really imitated life, I think. This film did a really good job of imitating life. And again, going back to the crying thing, like I don't cry a lot, but when I see other people cry or be emotional or be hurt, it hurts me. And so to see this beautifully framed, beautifully lit scene of watching a woman just struggle, that really hit me. And I think that was the point. And I think I feel really grateful, I guess, that that I kind of, you know, if that was the point that I, I got it. Um, but again, it's just so beautiful. These shots and the scenes and the angles and the camera and the light, it's just beautiful. Another thing that I really loved kind of, you know, piggybacking off of that is that they used film for this. So they did not shoot digital. Um, the cinematographer, Nicholas, really thought that digital just really creates this flat, kind of uninteresting feel to a scene. But with film, it brings it to life, in his opinion. And he also, you know, mentioned that with film, you don't have to pay so much attention to lights and colors because with film, it's just there. With digital, you have to enhance it, you have to change it, you have to fix it, you have to manipulate it. And he was saying that he really, really liked that they didn't really have to manipulate much. They got to just let it let it speak for itself. And I think that's great for a biography film. I think that's, you know, just like an interesting part of uh, an interesting piece to the puzzle of creating this story. So fun fact, with only 35 days um, for production, everyone had to move really quickly. And Craig, the director kept a log of the shoot, and as it turns out, they averaged one new setup every 20 minutes during the entire production, which is amazing. If you have ever been on a set, you know that there's so much sitting around, there is so much waiting, there is so much trying to figure out lighting and camera, and the second you have to change it, it just happens all over again. You are just sitting there and you're waiting, or you're working, and, and changing the setup and fixing it, and you're trying to stay on schedule and you have the first AD telling you that you're late or that you're not on schedule or that you have to move quicker. And to have a new setup every 20 minutes, like one and done, that's amazing. Also, another fun fact is that Margot Robbie took five months to learn how to ice skate. 
it was supposed to be four months, but she also injured herself. And so then it, it happened to be five. She said she wouldn't have done the film if she wasn't a producer on it because she knew that they couldn't afford to get a new person. But she did injure herself. And so she had to just kind of like fight through it, which props to her. So the title, I thought this was so interesting. The title is I, Tanya because it is after I, Claudius. I, Claudius is a 1934 historical novel by Robert Graves, written as if it were an autobiography by the Roman Emperor Claudius. So it's representing Stephen Rogers writing Tanya Harding's story as if he is Tanya Harding, which so cool. I never would have pieced that together, I don't think. But anyway, super cool. And then just a few more surprising facts. Allison Janney, who plays Harding's mother, actually used to be a competitive skater herself. Um, she gave up skating after a tendon injury in her leg, and then she went to college and became an actor, and she actually won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress because of this role. Also, even the parakeet that Janie like, had throughout the film on her shoulder had to audition. So there were like three different parakeets that had to work with Janie to like, see which one worked best. So they basically had to audition for their role, which is so funny. Also, just to you know show you how much impact this film had. Steven Rogers script was featured on the 2016 blacklist of the most liked scripts of the year. I think this movie just really represented so much of the figure skating community and just kind of told Tanya Harding's story and I really really liked it. I would encourage you guys to go watch it or rewatch it or even just look up some clips on YouTube so you can just kind of get the gist of what I'm saying because it's just so beautiful. I have to run. Thank you guys so much for listening again. Please like, subscribe, and leave a review if you enjoy this podcast. I would very much appreciate it. If you have any thoughts, please go to my website. There is a form under this episode where you can drop your thoughts, and I will respond as quickly as possible. I will talk to you soon. Bye. Now if you run into It isn't her. Could she love? Could she woo? Could she, could she, could she, could she coo as anybody?